Stephen Elabo. Welcome me to Deeper Life Bible Church Ministry, Charlottesville, United States. It is our belief that you will listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumuyi, and other ministers of God from our ministry, and they are sharing the mind of God with you and your family. God bless you and remain blessed. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 29. And I'm reading from verse 11, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God is a good God. One, he is a creator and he wants the best. He deserves the best for all his creatures. One, he wants every creature to be saved. Because quite a lot of blessings will follow after that salvation. But it's not only creator. As children of God, we know him as father. And he plans for all his children. No exception. For you as a child of God, you shall rest in your mind, rest in your heart. The Lord is planning for you, and his good plan will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. He knows what happiness is all about, and he knows what health is all about. He knows what heaven is all about, and he plans everything for you and much more. And so whatever he does in your life, whatever he brings about your life, is not asleep. It's not forgetful. He knows you. He'll get you saved, get you restored, get you holy, get you healthy, get you happy. And in heaven, eventually will have eternal fellowship with you. I pray you will not miss it. He had a great plan for the nation of Israel. But the nation of Israel did not understand the way of the Lord. Just like he has a glorious plan for the church today, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And his plan is perfect. His plan is profitable if we will accept the plan. That's why he had to repeat to the children of Israel as repeating to the church and is preaching to you and to me that I know the thoughts that I think toward you. He says, you may not know. You might have forgotten. But I still know the thought I'm thinking towards you. And then he tells us that everything will be the thought of peace and not of evil. And that expected end it will grant unto you. Then he said, Then shall ye go, then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. And he says, There shall be no doubt in your heart, I will hearken unto you. He has answered your prayer already. He says, They will answer. Many times children of God go about in life will become worried become anxious because of the noise we hear and because of the sights we see and because of the things around us or maybe because of the things we have ignorantly gone into and we're looking at the consequences and we're wondering whether the plan of God will still be fulfilled or not. He's planning for you and his plan will be fulfilled. And ye shall seek me and find me, you will find the Lord. When you shall search for me with all your heart. That plan of God is linked with the will of God. We're looking at Psalm 40 and verse 5. Psalm 40 verse 5. He has a plan for you. He has his will for you. A profitable will and a perfect will. In Psalm 40 verse 5, it says, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. Any child, of, any child of God in Israel could say that. Anyone in the church today could say that to you. Many are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. From the time he took them out of Egypt, the Egyptian bondage, and then led them through the wilderness with all the provisions he made for them. And how they got to the land of Canaan. All the ups and downs and the pitfalls and the dangers around them that he saved them from. They knew of the signs and the wonders. 
they knew of his supernatural hand, they knew of his protection provision, and they could say, Many, O oh Lord, my God. This is personal now, not just our God. You look at your life and you say, Not just that I belong to a church, I belong to God, I belong to Christ. I am a child of God, and He is my Savior, He is my Lord, my Master, and His own oh Lord, my God. Many are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which thou, which are to us what? They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee, if I would declare and speak of them. They are more than a number. They are more than my tongue can tell. Once again, we want to remind ourselves today of God's plan for his own. God's plan for his own. Already you know that he says, I know the thoughts I'm thinking towards you. And also the plans he has for you. The plans he has for every one of his children. That's the topic today. God's plan for his own. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the promise. The promise and the prediction of God's perfect will. If you're wondering what does God have for me, you don't have to be in ignorance because it's in the watch of God and he reveals his perfect will and he has power to fulfill that perfect will. The promise and the prediction of God's perfect will. Number two, the peril and the position in God's permissive will. There are people that have an idea. See, they say, the perfect will of God, that is God's best. They say, I know that. That God's perfect will is his best. But they say, if I cannot get the best, I will go for the second best. What they mean by that is, I'll go for his permissive will. I may not be able to wait and patiently tarry until I have the very best. The second best will be all right for me. You are going to discover that there is nothing as good as God's perfect will. And once you debate and you go beyond that perfect will and you go into that permissive will, there's peril there, there's perdition there. Number three, the perception and the preference of God's permanent will. God's permanent will. The one that says, I am God, I change not. And because he changes not all the good things he had for you at the very beginning of your Christian journey, that he said, I wish the best for you. I desire the best for you. You might have made some mistakes in your life and gone the other direction. And you're saying, God, I know that that thing will never hold again. He says, I'm God, I change not. My perfect will is my permanent will. And where I want you to be is that permanent place of blessing. I pray that there will be a restoration this morning in Jesus' name. The perception and the preference for God's permanent will. We're coming to number one, the promise and the prediction of God's perfect will. And there is something called the will of God. There is something very good, very nice, very wonderful, and it's seen that when they reach your life, it is the perfect will of God. And it tells us how to have that, how to move into that, how to experience that every day of our lives. I pray you'll discover. And I pray you live and abide in it. You'll never be the same again. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, mercies in the plural, the mercy that saved us, the mercy that gave us grace, the mercy that erased the judgment and the punishment of our lives, and the mercy that brings us into fellowship, relationship with God as our Father. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. is telling us now the preparation we make as we come into this perfect will of God. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It says any other thing is unreasonable. 
It's reasonable because it's unscriptural. It's reasonable because it's undesirable. It's reasonable because it's unprofitable that you present yourself to God holy and righteous before the Lord. That's the only thing that is acceptable, profitable, and reasonable. And be not conformed to this world. First of all, you must have a renewed mind, a changed mind, a transformed life. You must come out of darkness and come into the light. And you must focus on heaven. You're looking at the direction in which you are going. There must not be that thing in your mind. I want to be like them. I want to be like them. I want to love the world and the things of the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You renew your mind every time. The mind can go stale. The mind can go dull. The mind can become ignorant. The mind can become so weak and go the other direction. But you renew that mind. You energize that mind. You lift up that mind. And you brighten that mind. You refocus that mind. How? By the watch of God. Because it's the word of God that brings life. When something is dead, what, what brings revival is the word of life. The word of Christ. That Christ speaks to that mind again. And you renew your mind every time with the word of God. It says by the renewal of, the, of your mind that she may prove, here is it now, what is that good and acceptable and tell me the next thing there, a perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. I don't listen to the people that say that, you know, life is just like a gamble. You go here, you try this, it is trial and error. You try this, if it doesn't work, you try that, if it doesn't work, try another thing. They say, nobody can ever find out the perfect will of God and just stay there in that perfect will of God. Thank God you will find out. And you will live at that center of the sweet and profitable, perfect will of God in Jesus' name. He gives us the promise. He says, you'll find it. He gives us the promise. He says, it will enlighten you. He gives you the promise. I will not leave you in darkness. It will be done. We'll be studying about the children of Israel. And, uh, you know, it's uh, surprising they didn't understand the perfect will of God that here is what God had promised them. And if you look at what God had promised the children of Israel, that already revealed this perfect will. And let's come to Genesis chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 5. Here God made a covenant with Abraham. And the covenant he made with Abraham included something, there are a lot of things there, and if you see how God had been working on them, item by item, like in your life, everything God promises you, check up your life, he has done some already. He will do the rest. In Genesis chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 5. It says, Neither shall thy name be, uh, shall, shall thy name anymore be called Abraham, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. That's the promise of the Lord. And the Lord will, will fulfill that. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. Anybody there? I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. Tell me the rest there. And king shall come out of thee. That was the promise of God. That was the will of God. The perfect will of God. He was going to give them kings. That was his plan. But they needed to wait for the time of God. First of all, he led them into the land, the promised land. He gave them the land already. Because he told Abraham, he said, Look northward and southward and east and west. All this land that you see, I will give unto you. He should have been checking up item one that is fulfilled. And then he says, I'll take your children, your descendants, out of this place. I'll take them to the other place. Check up number two. That is fulfilled already. And the nations that will keep them captive all these many years. 
I'm going to require each of them. And when they go out, they'll go out with riches and wealth. That has been fulfilled already. They should have waited for the time of God. Because God said, kings will come out of thee. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her. You will bless your wife. I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. You know, God is very definite. He said, nations will come out of you. Then he said, I will give you a son, one son. It was so definite, and these were the promises of the Lord for him. It was the plan of God. It was the will of God. And the children of Israel, those descendants of Abraham, shall have said, God is good. And God is doing it one by one. He has done this, he has done this, he will do the next thing. Look at verse 16 there. And I will bless her and give thee a son also. Huh? Yea, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Tell me the rest over there. Kings of people shall be of her. There can be no doubt. There should be no doubt in our heart. He wants to give them, he wanted to give them kings. That kings will come out of them. And when God says something once, that's enough. When he says it twice, that's more than enough. In Genesis chapter 35. I'm reading from verses 11 and 12. Genesis 35, verses 11 and 12. He was going to talk to Jacob now, that is the grandson of Abraham. And was going to say the same thing, just to remind him that he had not forgotten. And God said unto him, Genesis 35, 11, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee. Would you please tell me the rest over there? A king shall come out of thine loins. You see that. God already planned. It is so will. He will give them kings. Maybe some things God has planned for you. You didn't know. You didn't go back to check up in the scriptures, in the promises given, in the prediction he had given. And because you think God does not know about this, does not know about this, and I want it, and I desire it, why don't you go back and check up in the will of God for you, that thing is already there. And if you will check up, and then you go back to God, you need to learn how to pray. David knew how to pray. What, how did David pray? David said, do you as thou hast said. If they had gone to uh, Samuel and said, would you please help us go and check up from God. He gave us this promise. Look at that in Genesis 17. He gave us that promise. Look at that in Genesis chapter 35. Will you intercede for us and pray for us? We're not asking for any other thing. You tell God, do you as thou hast said. Do you as thou hast said. We're not worried about your son that's between you and God. We're not worried about administration of Israel that's between you and God, setting up judges and this and that. You go and ask God about this, other, about other nations, what's our concern about other nations, that we will be like other nations. No, that's not our mind. Our mind is, you go tell, tell God concerning us, do you as thou hast said, if you pray like that, you will always answer your prayer. And you will always get the best. I said you will always get the best. Look at this in verse 11 right there. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee. I will give it, and thy seed after thee will I give the land. It wasn't only that um, the children of Israel knew about this. Come to Numbers. In Numbers chapter 23. In Numbers chapter 23, I'm reading to start with from verse 9. 
Numbers chapter 23, and we're looking at verse 9. Here in verse 9 it says, For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone. The people shall dwell alone. God said, I have chosen you, children of Israel, as a peculiar people. Extraordinary people. He said, apart people, sanctified people, you will glorify my name. I don't want you to be like the others. I wiped out all the other nations in the land of Canaan. Why? They didn't live right. I wasn't happy with them. I wasn't pleased with them. But I have chosen you. I am pleased with you. I don't want you to be like them. You will be separate. And here Balaam in his prayer was reiterating the same thing, repeating the same thing. The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. They'll be peculiar. They'll be unique. They'll be different. They'll be distinct. They will not be like any of the others at all. But that's exactly where they fail. Instead of the other nations looking up to them, they were looking up to the other nations. And they wanted to be like the other nations. And that was the reason for one teeny king. But God said, I'll make you separate. I'll make you peculiar. I'll make you totally different from them. On the basis of being different, then I'll give you kings. Come to that same chapter, verse 21. In verse 21, and he has beheld, he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord is God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. The shout of a king is among them. That's what Balaam saw when Moab said, when Balak said, Come curse the people for me. He said, These people, they're exalted, they're lifted up, they're peculiar, they're separate, they're distinct. They are set apart from all the other nations. I even see, I hear the victory, the victory shout of the king in their midst. Chapter 24 of Numbers. I'm reading from verse 7. Chapter 24, verse 7. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag. You see that? When you mention, when you come to Agag in um, chapter 15 of, uh, of uh, 1 Samuel, you think that's the first place we think of Agag. It's been given in prophecy that his king shall be greater and higher, mightier than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Well, you can see now the plan of God for them. And these were the covenant promise revealed. Even at this time, do you remember when uh, Anna, the mother of uh, Samuel, was praying? Look at part of the prayer that uh, the mother of Samuel preached in the prophetic utterance of the mother of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. I thought you'd say, great amen there. See, your enemies are his enemies. And those who fight against God, you don't need a king like the other nations to be able to overcome them. You have overcome already. The adversaries of the, of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. That was fulfilled in chapter 7 of First Samuel. You see, as you read all these things, you say, God said that before. He'll send thunder, and he will scatter all his enemies. And then it says, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. He shall give strength unto who? Unto his king. That is, he was going to appoint his own king to represent him here on earth among the children of Israel. And Anna prophesied and prayed, and he said, there will be thundering that will come first. If they had just waited some time, 
they will find that as God was kind of fulfilling all his promises for them, the one for the king was even next, that God was going to give them the king. But now they were too much in a hurry. There are some people you have been praying for something, and that's the will of God, and God wants to do it. And then just a month before God does it, you've been waiting for years. And here you are now, just a few weeks, a few months before God does that thing, you take gloves into your hand. You say, I must have this. I'm tired. I cannot wait again. I pray that God will give you the spirit of patience. You'll wait for God and you will get the best from God. God's perfect will. God's perfect will. It's coming. I said it's coming. You will not miss it in Jesus' name. He says he shall, he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Well, it's very clear from the word of God that God had a perfect will for them. That's why God said in Psalm 81, Psalm 81, he tells us in verse 13, Psalm 81, reading from verse 13, he says, Oh, that my people are Hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. If they had just been patient and they had waited for me, then he said, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fetched them also with the fat, with the finest of wheat, and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. He will satisfy you with honey out of the rock. He only got water out of the rock. And God said, I see I have something greater, I have something sweeter, the sweet will of God, the profitable will of God. You will not miss it. In the case of the children of Israel, because of being in a hurry and because of being ignorant of the perfect will of God, they went into pressurizing God. Do it now. Give it to us now. We want to be like all the other nations. We're tired being peculiar. We don't want to be like a kind of a house that is set on the mountain top. We do not want to be the head that you have appointed us to be. We want to be like everybody else. Therefore, give us the king right now so that we can say, uh, you know, the Syrians have their king, Egyptians have their kings, and we also, we are like the Egyptians and we have our kings. They wanted something greater for them. They brought themselves low. The Lord has lifted you up. You will not come down. He wants you to be above all the others. He wants you to be exemplary and peculiar. Beyond all the others, you will not be like the others in Jesus' name. The peril, number two now is the peril, and the perdition in God's permissive will. The peril and the perdition in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm reading here from verse 4 to verse 7. In verse 4, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. Thou art old. I don't know what parameters they were using. I don't know what they were thinking of when they said, Behold, thou art old. Because it was uh, just about 60 years of age at this time. Not old, not as old as Abraham was when God talked to him. Not as old as uh, when uh, Jacob was, you know, coming from uh, Laban and God spoke to him. Not as old as uh, Moses when God was still talking to Moses. Not as old as Joshua when God said, rise up and take the there's still much ahead of you. Not as old as Caleb that said, give me this mountain. But in their own evaluation, they said, the elders of Israel came and they said, Behold, now thou art old. Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And then you read the rest of the story. The thing displeased Samuel. And God says, Samuel, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. Or tell them. What will be the attitude of that king? The activities of that king? 
and all that the king will do is ambition as well. And then tell them when they have their will eventually. When this permissive will is given to them, eventually it is not going to be profitable. It's going to be terrible on them. At that time, they will come back to me and pray. And they will say, well, sorry, but nothing will change. I will not answer them. Look at verse 18. And you shall call out in that day when troubles arise. When the choice, when their choice becomes negative. When everything goes sour. It says, and you shall cry in that day because of your king. Which ye shall have chosen you. Which ye shall have chosen you. This is not my perfect will. It's my permissive will and it's your choice, not my choice. Then it says, your cry, your call, your pray, your plead, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. What a terrible thing that the Lord will leave them to their choice. And the Lord said, he was not going to answer them that day. And let us look at it. Eventually, they, they chose the king. And what kind of king did they choose? A, kind, a king that didn't have faith in God. A king that, well, he had the stature, the stamina, he had the look, and he was uh, higher and above all the others. He was humble at first. A king that became proud. A king that would not obey the Lord. Even in the first time, the Lord sent him. A king that eventually lost out. I did not find his way back to God. A king that ended up in the shrine of a familiar spirit people. In First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression. Which he committed against the Lord. Even against the watch of the Lord. Which he kept not. Or, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. You know, this uh, Saul was humble at the beginning. If he had not taken this position of the king that they pushed him into, that they pressurized God that he must have, that uh, eventually fitted into that position, he might not have gone into the situation he got into. If God had chosen a king by himself, a man at his own heart, he would not have gotten into this, but eventually he got into this. And responsibilities he never expected. Responsibilities he never prepared for going into battle because that's why they chose him actually. Eventually because he couldn't match up with that, he wanted the power of darkness to help him. In verse 14, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore God slew him. He died in sin, died in evil, died after consulting the familiar spirit and went to hell. And you know, when people, they put pressure, or want a king, or want this, or want that, and you appear to be the one elected into the position they were fighting for, be very careful of in that position, that you might go from that position to everlasting fire. Because it says, and then it turns the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. We're looking at Hosea chapter 13. Hosea chapter 13. And see what actually happened uh, to him eventually. And how they got the will, the permissive will of God. And that permissive will uh, now spelled out their doom and perdition. Hosea chapter 13, verse 9. O Israel, that was destroyed thyself. The people that tell us, uh, you know, God's will will always be done. He chose them from all eternity. And he's going to save them whether they like it or not. And he's going to take them to heaven. They are eternally secured. They said their salvation is not in their hands. It's in the hands of God. God had predicted them saved before they were born. And now they are saved by the sovereign will of God. And eventually, whatever, they might go into the far country, they might backslide, they might become prodigal, some prodigal daughter, 
but once saved, always saved. That God is stronger than man, and God is stronger than themselves. Even if they want to perish, they cannot perish because God has saved them from all eternity. I'm sure you don't want to listen to such people. God has given you a free will, a will to choose. It says, I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He counsels you. He exhorts you. He wants you to choose life that you may live and your children. But if you choose death, God cannot force you to choose life. He puts it before you. The same thing with the children of Israel. He says, thou hast destroyed thyself. I didn't destroy you. That wasn't my will. I wanted the very best for you. And I pray the best God has for you, you will have in Jesus' name. Oh, Israel, 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 thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. I will be the king. You see, you wanted to be the king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? And thy judges of whom thou saidst, Give me a king and princess. I give thee a king because that's what you wanted. You pressurize until I said, okay, get it and let me rest. I give you a king in my anger. And I took him away in my wrath. Obviously, you understand, anyone who dies under the wrath of God is not going to get to heaven. That man lost his very soul. Uh, uh, see, the question is, uh, does God still do that today? Does he, you know, yield to our pressure? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And uh, some of these uh, people that have, uh, you know, the only ministry they have is a praying ministry. And you can go to them and hire them and give them whatever price they give you. And you say, this is what I want. Those people will not ask you, is that the will of God? Is that the word of God? What's, what does the Bible say? What's the doctrine? What's the teaching? What did Christ say? Uh -uh. They don't understand that. Once you give them the prayer request, they go into fasting and praying. And they will, they will pray. They will knock. They will push every door. They will make sure that anything that is going to hinder the answer to that prayer, are they not prophets? Are they not prayer warriors? Are they not people that are specialized in prayer? They say, leave that with me. I'll get it through for you. And there you are. You are thinking, you know, they will get it for me. They may get it for you. But what's going to be the end? We're well, looking at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. I'm reading from verse 29. It says, so... They did each and were filled, and for he gave them their own desire, not God's desire. It wasn't what God wanted. He gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them. While the meat, they got it by putting pressure. We we'll want this. We cannot trust and say we have this. We remember what we used to eat in Egypt. And look at this. That you're giving us this light bread. You call manna. We're fed up with this. Give us what we want. He gave them what they wanted. And then it says, while the meat was in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fastest of them, the fattest of them, and smote down the chosen men of Israel. They died under the wrath of God. I pray it will not happen to you. I was waiting for you. Amen there. You know, if you're just living your life as a Christian, he knows the best for you. Even without your asking, he will give unto you. Because he has already prophesied and predicted and promised. He said, this is what you have. He puts your feet on the narrow road that leads to heaven. He'll make everything possible for you to be an overcomer on that road. Enemies might come. You have overcome already. He said, fear them not. Don't fear their faces. I'm with you. I will be with you. I appointed you. I saved you. And I will care for you. Let us therefore come to the throne of grace that we may obtain help at the time of need. He will always help you. But you know, if you forget that, that God is taking care of you, and is going to supply all your needs. 
And the Lord Jesus said, take no thought. What are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What about this? What about that? He says, look at the sparrows. The Lord is taking care of them. He will take care of you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Tell me the rest. All this is nothing of the blessings of God that is made for you will be missing in Jesus' name. And since he's going to do that, he's not a forgetful God. It's not a negligent God. It's not going to abandon you in the way. It will take care of you until the very last breath on earth, and it will take you to heaven eventually. You look at uh, Psalm, Psalm 81. Psalm 81. I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 81, verse 11. But my people would not hearken unto my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own hearts unto their own hearts lost, and they watch in their own counsels. He said, because they will not listen to me, so I give them up. I pray he will not give you up. But remind, remind yourself once again, the people that say, you know, once you are saved, you are always saved. It doesn't matter. The Lord will hold on to you like this. He will not allow you to go astray. Even if you want to go astray, even if you want to backslide, even if you are bent on going back into the world, you want to backslide, you want to go to hell, God will not allow it. He will hold you on because once saved, always saved. God said, I am not like that. I don't force heaven on anyone. I don't force holiness on anyone. He said, I would have saved them. I was holding them. But he said, no, we don't want this, and they went their own way, and I gave them up to their own hearts lost. I pray I will not give you up. In Psalm 106, Psalm 106, and here we're reading from verse 13. Psalm 106, from verse 13. The son forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and tempted God in the desert, he gave them, always notice that, he gave them their request, but sent leanness unto their soul. But sent leanness unto their soul. Actually, that's what the Lord has said. Look at um, Isaiah chapter 66. I'm reading here from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse four, 66, verse 4. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because, because, because when I called, none did answer. When I speak, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. They chose that in which I delighted not. There are some people that feel that, you know, every door that opens must be God's will. But you look at that door that opens. If that door leads to the broad way, that's not the will of God. If that door leads to a way that is not the way of holiness, the highway of righteousness, that's not the will of God. There are things that you will choose, and it is not of God. And it says, I give them up, and they chose that in which I delighted not in. But looking at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 2. Ezekiel 14, verse 2. And see the policy of God and the principle of God and how God acts. And you will see that here, it doesn't force his perfect will on anyone. You voluntarily choose that perfect will, and the blessing of the perfect will will come upon your life. And then you rebelliously reject the perfect will and say, I prefer, I prefer the second best. I prefer the permissive will. That's enough for me. And perdition will come with that permissive will. In Ezekiel chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put the stumbling block of the iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? They're not sincere. They're not transparent. They're not desirous of my perfect will. 
Should they come before me and waste my time saying, they are asking for my will in verse 4. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up the his idol in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet and cometh to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. You know, there are people that go from church to church. They are really not, you know, intending to serve the Lord. What are they looking for? They're looking for a particular thing. They have their idol in their heart. And they come to a church like this and they hear the word of God about salvation, about follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Oh, they say, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for another thing. Then they go to another place. And then they say that, uh, you know, that person says, I am a prophet. And then I can see into the future. I see into this, I see into that. Oh, they say, this person may be able to help me and uphold the idol in the heart. And then they go to that person. Oh, that fellow says, that's very simple. In fact, I saw it before you came. That this is, and the, the, the rest, they were rested. They said, I've come to the place I'm going. The man, as even promised now, is going to place it before the Lord. And then the fellow goes to pray and he comes to tell them, Yes, I got an answer for you. You'll be happy about this. And then he tells them, and it's exactly what they wanted because it fitted the idol in their heart. Be very careful. Be very careful. Look at what God says. If they come to the prophet and they have their idol in their heart, this is what we want. This is the kind of doctrine we want. This is the kind of dressing we want. This is the kind of ceremony we want. And this is the kind of church administration we want. And this is the kind of church policy we want. And then you find a church that gives you exactly what you are looking for. That matches the idol in your heart. Look at verse 5. That I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. Because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from your idols. And turn away your faces from all your abominations for every one of the house of Israel and of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idol in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived, when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived the prophet. I have permitted that deception. Because this fellow is going about, he doesn't want to serve me. He's not looking for the right thing. He just wants somebody that will support the idol. And he's going to be like Balaam. And he's going to say, should I do that? And I'm going to put you in the mouth of that prophet. Yes, go and do it. Should I go that way? Yes, go and go, go that way. Should I marry an unbeliever? Of course, go ahead and go and marry the unbeliever. Shall I marry a false prophet? Of course, of course. And then when they, they will say, God said, you know, if there's deeper life, they will not pray, they will not see vision, they don't believe in vision, they just go back and say, according to Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible, Bible, but this one now, this one has seen revelation. This one has seen vision. That's the vision that will take them to hell. I pray you will not be there. I said you will not be there. And if you are one where the people, this the people like, you know, go from church to church, you are tasting church as the drunkards are tasting wine. They want to drink this and drink this, and which one feels better. It's not the feeling. It's not the look. It is the word of God being there. This word of God will never depart from you. In verse 9, and if the prophet be deceived, 
when he has spoken a sin, I, the Lord, have deceived the prophet. I will stretch out my hand upon him. Look at this. And I will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Listen to this in verse 10. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the of Una. Tell me out loud. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Perdition of the people that are seeking the permissive will of God. Prayer and pressure of man's perverted will eventually will lead people like Saul, like Balaam to hellfire. God's permissive will is dangerous and eternally damnable. I pray that that will not be your Lord. Actually, why does God do that? Why does God allow people to be deceived like that when they go from place to place seeking prophecy and speaking, seeking revelation? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 9, uh, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. See that? There are some, sometimes you, you say, they say there's a miracle somewhere. And when you look at it, it looks like a miracle. But it's a miracle of deception. Signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. You will not perish. I will not perish. We shall not perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They receive not the love of the truth. The truth of repentance, they don't want that. The truth of restitution, they don't want that. The truth of seeking the face of the Lord, turning away from sin, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved, changed and transformed. They say, no, we don't want that. I want religion that will profit us, religion that will bring money, religion that will bring prosperity, the religion that will allow the, the loss of the flesh. They do not have the love of the truth that they might be saved. And then it goes on, for this reason, for this cause, because of this, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They will believe a lie. I will not believe a lie. You will not believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This will not be your Lord. Let's come now to point number three, the perception and the press and the preference for God's permanent will. God's permanent will. Wonderful and blessed is the man, the woman that recognizes God's permanent will. That God says, I am God, I change not. This is my will, perfect will, permanent will. Because he does not change. And then you want him to teach you that will. Psalm 143. Psalm 143. And we're reading here from verse 10. The prayer you ought to pray. And the prayer you ought to pray every time, uh, it's not just about marriage. There are people that are thinking, anytime we're talking about the will of God, we're thinking of how to get married. Okay, how about after you have got married? Don't you, don't you need the perfect will of God anymore? How about where you live, where you work? Don't you understand that Lord had a challenge of where to live? And he didn't choose God's perfect will when, God told, when Abraham told him, choose wherever you want. If you go to the south, I'll go to the north. If you go to the east, I'll go to the west. He needed the will of God at that time. But he chose by the sight of his face. And then that led him into dwelling in Sodom. And all the people he took there actually perished. And then you're thinking about upper and root. It's not about marriage now. It's just about, and you see, the will of God. For you to stay here or for you to go yonder. And Orpah chose what she wanted, and she perished with idolatry. And Ruth chose the will of God. And so, as we're talking about the will of God, it's not just about, okay, uh, I want to get married, 
I need the will of God. Yes, you do. Or I want to, how about your education? Will of God. How about the place to work? Will of God. How about when somebody gives you a gift? For example, if that gift is going to lead you away from the center of the will of God, you know how to reject that will. How about when you give you a position? Position somewhere on top over there, on the top of the mountain over there. They give you that position. Maybe a position in the nation, a position in religion, a position anywhere. Are you not going to find out, is this the will of God? Because that position may lead you to everlasting fire eventually. That's why you want to pray this prayer. Psalm 143, and I'm reading from verse 10. Teach me to do thy will. I want to know that will. And I want to do that will. Teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me. In the, into the land of uprightness. The prayer you need to pray. Why is that prayer important? Because your getting to heaven hinges on that prayer. Your getting to heaven and your spending eternity in heaven is based on that prayer, knowing the will of God and doing the will of God. Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Do you ever think about that at all? I come to church, that's saying, Lord, Lord. I read the Bible, that's saying, Lord, Lord. I've been baptized in water, that's saying, Lord, Lord. I've been confirmed in our denomination, that's saying, Lord, Lord. I am in a position of authority in our church, that's just saying, Lord, Lord. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Are you walking the way of righteousness and holiness? Are you obeying the word of God in the private and in the public? Are you a real child of God, transparent, and you are transparently following the Lord? Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We're looking at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 15. First John chapter 2, we're looking at it, verse 15. It says in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When you say, I want to be like all the other nations, what's that? That's loving the world. You love what they do more than the way of the Lord. You love their look, their appearance, their attitude more than... You have listened to our pastor, Pastor W.F. Mouye. And I believe the word will dwell in your heart. Jesus name. Let us pray. Our mighty Father, we thank you, Lord, because of the message you have given to us this afternoon. I pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ for every year that I'm listening to the word. It will be fruitful in their life in Jesus' name. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, every one of us shall dwell with you in the kingdom of God and the last day. Thank you, O Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.